I was a professional photographer for like 15 years before I took up video and I had a Canon 5D Mark II. I thought it would just be as easy as like putting on a tripod and hitting the record button because it had HD video. And oh my God, did I underestimate how hard it is for someone with photography skills to learn video. I'm going to translate your photography skills into video skills, not to teach you everything that you need to know, but to get you a jump start and sort of guide you in your further studies. No sponsor, just lots of information. I want to say as a photographer, you have a huge head start on somebody learning video from scratch, but it can also be a disadvantage. If somebody wants to become a videographer or a filmmaker, they go in learning all that terminology. And as a photographer, you have to walk some stuff back. You actually have to unlearn some things. You have to maybe detach yourself from the equipment you're used to using to use some different equipment. It's going to be harder in some ways. I also want to say not all videographers are the same. Some are cinematic videographers. They consider themselves filmmakers and they have priorities over beautiful lighting and compositions and other people like me were very practical. Video is just a means to an end. I want to communicate. I want to educate and video is the most effective way for me to do that. So my perspective is that of a very practical person and you'll pick up some of that in the ways that I teach things but people who have different priorities will teach things differently and I'm totally fine with that. Background to me, I was a photographer professionally for 27 years in a variety of different genres and I've been a videographer now for about 12 years. I've made about 1900 videos which is pretty productive for 12 years of work and here on YouTube I've gotten about 250 million views so if people can stand to watch my videos I'm not doing everything <laughs> wrong right and total amount of viewing time is about 3200 years and also I love the scientific process. I love having ideas and then testing them and acknowledging when you're right and wrong. And on this channel, I have been very quietly using you, the viewer, in various A-B testing. I will try out different techniques, different equipment, and I will comb through the comments semi-scientifically determining which changes people liked and which they disliked. And so a lot of that feedback you're going to see in the ways that I educate you now. First, why would photographers want to get into video? I hear all the time, oh, I don't want a camera with video. I'm just a stills photographer. Well, video is so powerful as I was just describing. It has the power of a still photo, but it adds more storytelling potential. It adds sound. It adds immersion. Stills were really predominant, I think largely because of technological limitations, because of modern bandwidth, wireless bandwidth, Wi-Fi. We all have like pretty high megabit streaming right now. And that has made video as accessible as stills, but because it is more immersive, consumers have shown their preference for video. And that's why nowadays social media is mostly video and not that much stills. For professionals, the market for stills photography is actually shrinking because of a variety of different factors, but the market for professional video is actually growing. So adding video into your mix can prolong your career and add a lot of diversity to it. It also makes you eligible to take jobs that require both stills and video because if a company has to hire a separate videographer and a separate stills guy, they might just go with the one hybrid shooter so they don't have to write two separate checks. Finally, the newest trend in imaging is artificial intelligence generated imaging. AI will definitely do video at some point, but that's further down the road. AI imaging for stills is here today and already impacting the market. So if you add video into professional skill mix, that future proofs you at least a few further years out. I'm going to talk about camera settings, techniques, and some aspects of the business, but let's start with the camera settings. And I want to say it's not as important as you think. People always treat the f-stops and the shutter speeds as the most important thing, but no, by far, it is the story that you tell. It is your subject matter that matters the most. The camera settings, you could just forget it and leave the camera on auto if you want to. In fact, that's why so many people making videos professionally are just using their smartphone and they haven't done any study. You could be successful if you have an interesting subject. With that said, let's talk about focus. As a stills photographer, you probably use autofocus all the time, but you probably rattle off three pictures and maybe you miss focus on one of them and you just pick the one that's in focus. But with video, you don't have that luxury. It needs to stay in focus all the time. And in my A-B testing, if there was a shot that was a little bit out of focus, you guys noticed 
you hated it, and you clicked out of the video. I'm filming this on a Canon R6. The other cameras in the studio are very cheap Canon RPs. I bought them for $900 or less, and we use them all the time, and they have literally never failed us once. Canon PDAF software since the Canon 70D has been pretty much bulletproof. Also, the recent Sony cameras, things like the Sony a7S III, the Sony a7 IV, the ZV-E1, the ZV-E10, those do great for autofocus. But other cameras, it falls off. You will see lots of demonstrations online where people say the autofocus is great. But I have tested the Nikon, the Fuji, the Panasonic, the Olympus, all the other cameras, and they often work, but they often break your heart. And you, even if you're behind the camera, you might not notice that the focus like pulses in and out in a way that p does bother people enough that they will comment on it. And for that reason, I, I don't trust those cameras for any video that requires autofocus. But the good news is you always have the option to manually focus. And if you have a camera and it doesn't meet those autofocus requirements, just manual focus or single autofocus so that it doesn't move. Next is your aperture, your f-stop. As stills photographers, we kind of had the luxury of shooting with like a 50 f1.2 lens and rattling off a couple of shots. Maybe the camera focuses on eyelashes instead of the iris, and that's okay. We throw out that one shot and we pick another one, but for video, you need to be continually in focus. And even on the best of cameras, the video autofocus is not as strong as it is for stills. So if you want shallow depth of field in video, I'm shooting at 50 f1.2 right now, then you need a camera that has amazing video autofocus. And you need an expensive fast prime lens. Therefore, shallow depth of field gives a professional look because we're accustomed to really only seeing that in more cinematic professional productions. You don't see that with smartphones. But it ends up being expensive and often difficult and you might have to do a couple of takes to make sure that you have coverage because something might fall out of focus. You should know that humans move. Even me standing here, I am emoting and that requires me to move in and out. If you are shooting an interview and you want that second shot which is tight and telephoto and blurs the background really nicely, some a B camera that you can cut to, well that person, they're a civilian, they're not an actor, right? they're going to be moving and they might start out leaning forward and you'll focus on them, you'll nail focus and then you know what, halfway through the interview they're going to lean back and then they're going to ruin your whole <laughs> shot. If you want shallow depth of field, if you want background blur, it's not the same for stills. You will often need to crank up the aperture, particularly if you have an autofocus system that is not 100% reliable and if you are manually focusing, People move, so you're going to have to be sure to track them as they move in and out, or you're trashing the entire shot. You're reshooting, right? Actors are to video what models are for still photography, and actors often know how to emote and act within a focal plane. So if you are filming them, they can sit there and cry and yell and cheer at 50 f1.2 with the background blur and their eye stays in focus because they can actually work with the cameraman to stay in focus. Like maybe they have an amazing focus puller, but often the actor is doing a lot of the work. Civilians won't know how to do that. Get a lot of questions about resolution. Usually it goes like, hey, which 4K camera should I buy? Which 8K camera should I buy? I have a budget of $1,000 or something. And usually what I say to them is, forget the resolution. You are asking the wrong question. You should not start by wanting 4K. 4K really does not matter for the vast majority of scenarios. To put this into perspective, social media, the resolution you actually consume it at is probably more like 480p or lower because everything is really compressed down and everybody's looking at it on their phone for the most part, right? YouTube, most of the videos, even from the top creators, they're just 1080. I'm recording this in 1080. I record all our podcasts, all our news pieces in 1080 because I'm in the studio. I'm, it's an R6. It's a 4K camera, but you know what? I don't want to bother transferring the 4K file to my computer. That would take longer to copy the file. The workflow cost and the storage costs are not worth me publishing in a 4K because nobody cares. And I know this through tons and tons of A-B testing. I publish things in 4K often. I publish things in HD often. Nobody notices. Viewing time does not change. Less than 4K is absolutely fine. If you watch IMAX, most IMAX is shot and displayed in just 2K. So even that is not 4K. Now Netflix is 4K and on my 4K TV, I think it looks really good. But when I watch something in just HD, you know what? 
I don't think about it. The only people who really think about it are the people who really know 4K and 8K and 2K, like videographers, right? We're the only ones who actually care. We're a very small part of the audience. There's literally nothing that is 8K. So don't get too excited about the new R5 or A1 or Z8 because they're doing 8K because nobody really cares. But those extra megapixels are useful for the purposes of cropping later because I often crop very deeply either because I want to do a jump cut that I don't want to appear like a jump cut or because I want to recompose a shot like I started out centered and suddenly I want it to be the rule of thirds having more megapixels means I can crop more deeply without it having any effect on the final product but with that said I see huge creators like Mr. Beast doing jump cuts from HD and then jumping in five times zoom so that the final product is like a hundred lines of resolution and it's all blurry. He's like the most popular person on the planet. So you can see even in those scenarios, the extra resolution doesn't really matter. When you're budgeting your video gear, I recommend people pick gear that has good video autofocus over those that have lots of resolution. But this depends on your style of shooting. If you're doing all manual focus, you don't really care about that. Via my A-B testing, I have also found that higher frame rates are more meaningful to viewers than higher resolution. At some point in our YouTube career, we were filming everything at 4K 30 or 24 frames per second with very nice Panasonic GH4, GH5 cameras manual focus, everything. And our entire production was set up around that. And then Chelsea was finally like, I, I, don't, I don't want a tripod and all this. I'm just going to grab my Canon 6D, which had a flip screen. And she put it in 1080 at 60 frames per second and published a video that she just filmed herself. And you know what? People loved it. I got, and I know that because people say, Oh, what kind of camera did you use to film this? Looks, looks, looks so much better than your regular stuff, right? Even though the camera was cheaper, even though it was HD instead of 4K, objectively it was a worse cinema camera, but it produced better results. Why? Because people didn't care about the resolution, but they did care about the frame rate. Higher frame rates, like the 60 frames per second I'm showing this in, it's more realistic, more like what we really see. And for the purposes of this type of video, where it's be, being me, I'm not acting, I'm not wearing special effects outfits, pretending to be an alien or an elf or something, right? I'm just me and I seem more human at higher frame rates. And so for that reason, I do recommend 60p for things like social media things where everybody is just themselves. But 30 frames per second is absolutely fine. With that said, you're going to find a large portion of the video community insists on using 24p. We associate all those feelings of fun that we had at the theater with that kind of choppy look that you get from 24p. And when we see something in 24p, that can kind of bring it all back. For some videographers, that's enough for them to choose 24p over higher frame rates that are technically superior. I am fine with that. If you are going for a cinematic look, please use 24p. Besides the smoothness of shooting at 60 frames per second, you can slow your 60 frames per second footage down to 30 frames per second and double the length of any clip. And that is a trick I've used so many times to get coverage. Here's a real story. We had a sponsored video that we produced where we had to hold up a device and talk about it a little bit. The sponsor didn't like what we said. They wanted us to go back and say something that was twice as long as what we originally said. And then I was pushed for what's called coverage, making sure you have enough shots to cover all the information that you need to convey. I had to go back and sort of dub or voice over part of it with this much longer thing. So where was I going to get this extra coverage? Well, I cropped in two times on the product that I was talking about and slowed the footage down from 60 frames per second to 30 frames per second. Nobody noticed. It doubled the length of the clip to cover my voiceover and everybody was happy. 60 frames per second saved the day. It saved me having to go and reshoot. And for that reason, when we're out in the field, we're filming everything in 4K 60. Now let's talk about the shutter speed, another hotly debated thing in videography. And as a photographer, you're used to choosing the shutter speed either for your exposure or to get clean images or because you want to show a certain amount of movement. If you're taking photos of a race car going past, you want the wheels to spin so it doesn't look like it's parked. Maybe you'll pick 1 30th of a second if the car is going 30 miles per hour. The logic is totally different in video. First, 
I'll talk about the 180 rule, which is another traditional cinema rule that has its roots back in the origins of filmmaking. You needed a shutter speed that was twice as fast as your frame rate. Thus, if you were shooting at 24 frames per second, which everybody did, your shutter speed would be, well, 1 48th or one, basically 1 50th of a second. I did the 180 rule for years until one time I forgot my ND filters and we were shooting out in the sun and I could not get the can aperture down far enough to hit the 180 roll. And guess what I found out from your feedback? Nobody cared. I've shot at one four thousandth of a second. Nobody cares. <laughs> no. Nobody cares on YouTube, but your cinematic audience might notice if you're shooting a Netflix film and you're mixing in footage that's at 50th of a second, you probably don't want to jump to one one thousandth of a second because it could be jarring, but if you're filming an entire piece, generally nobody cares. Still, in the studio here, I am following the 180 rule on this R6. You know why? Because I control the light, I'm setting it up one time, there's no particular cost to me to pick the 180 rule in here, so I go ahead and use it as a default. Whenever I can, whenever there isn't some limitation on me, I pick the 180 roll, but I don't sweat it. But I will say, one of the differences between still cameras and cinema cameras is that cinema cameras often have a built-in ND filter helping you to get the shutter speed that you want without having to adjust the aperture. Faster shutter speeds are going to produce sharper results because each individual frame will not have as much motion in it. Now, they could look choppy because when you have a little bit of blur, well, yeah, there's going to be a gap if you're following the 180 rule, but things still have motion and our eyes do capture things with motion. If you wave your hand like this, I can see motion with my eyes. So that motion is natural. Now let's talk about auto exposure. When you take still photos, you don't really care if the exposure from one frame matches to another because you're going to pick a frame and it's usually going to be displayed independently. And even if it didn't, you're going to go in and edit each individual frame, including things like contrast and exposure. But with video, that's a little bit different. First of all, the exposure needs to remain consistent within any single shot. And for that reason, manual exposure tends to be much more important than it is in stills photography. I use aperture or shutter priority for all of my stills. I never use manual exposure unless like I'm in a studio or I'm doing night photography, but I almost always use manual exposure for video unless I'm in a situation with wildly changing lights, like I'm moving around and I'm going from shadow to sunlight then I have to use auto exposure, I have no choice. But I'm never very happy when I do have to use auto exposure because cameras today, they aren't that advanced with auto exposure, particularly Sony cameras, which we use all the time, like the Sony a7S III, the auto exposure just varies up and down. Even though it's just me standing in a camera in a studio with constant lights, if you scrub through, you'll see exposures just going up and down in a way that I cannot easily compensate for in post. For those reasons, manual exposure can be really helpful. Canon auto exposure tends to be better, but I still prefer to do manual exposure whenever possible. If you're a stills photographer, you might be accustomed to fixing exposure problems in post, particularly if you shoot raw. I can often fix the exposure by six or eight stops and still produce a usable image. It works a little bit differently for video. Most cameras do not support raw video. Most video is what they call 8-bit, which means each of the red, green, blue color values has 256 possible values. And if your sky is all blue, that means there's only 256 gradients because you're only seeing blue, right? And if you raise the exposure a whole bunch, and now you're not using 256 gradients, but maybe you're only using the bottom 1 to 32 gradients, you're going to end up with a lot of like big chunky pixelation in sky because you don't have the same room for gradients. And that means that 8-bit video isn't particularly editable. You can edit it. You could easily bring 8-bit video up a stop or two and nobody complains in my experience. But we have taken to shooting exclusively 10-bit footage on the go when we're doing run and gun stuff because sometimes the exposure does miss and sometimes we do need to either raise up the shadows in high dynamic range situations or even bring things down a little bit. 10-bit video, particularly HLG, HDR video, or something like Vlog, those can be extremely helpful in those situations where you don't nail the auto exposure. That means you can lock it into manual exposure and not worry about auto exposure variations. And if the sun goes behind a cloud and you need to raise the exposure, you can probably do that pretty well with 10-bit video. Some cameras do offer raw video and it is a proper raw like the Canon R5 has this and it works a lot like you editing a raw image. You can pull up the shadows a ton and it is extremely helpful but I don't shoot that because the file sizes are so 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 huge. 
It impedes my workflow. It takes a long time to copy those files. When I transfer the footage across the internet to my video editor, Frank, it's going to take him forever. And hell, he'd probably have to buy an extra hard drive just to take a raw video that was as long as this one, right? So for that reason, I don't use raw in practice, but I would turn it on in extreme situations where the exposure was going to be really difficult. In fact, I do not even use various log formats because I find particularly the 8-bit video log can actually degrade the quality because it's spreading so much dynamic range across just 8 bits of information. So log with 10-bit is better, but I still don't find that I need it most of the time. If the clouds in the sky are a little bright and the highlights are clipped, like that's the kind of thing nobody cares about because they're focused on the subject. Exposure for the subject, just like in still photography, remains the most important thing. And you don't need to sweat the highlight or shadow information as much as you would in a landscape photo. With camera settings out of the way, I'm going to move on and talk about videography techniques for those of you with experience in stills photography. And this is just a primer. First, I'm kind of saying the quiet part out loud because there has been a cultural shift. Young people film video differently and they do not necessarily trust people who use traditional techniques because those traditional cinematic techniques like having multiple cameras and not having jump cuts, that feels corporate to them. Traditional feels old and corporate and that feels insincere. So we shot traditionally with multiple cameras, zero jump cuts, lots of beautiful B-roll for so many years. And then one night, Chelsea and I were at a press event and we had a deadline that was like, we had to publish a video at like 1 a.m. And we were out with all our friends, like Chris and Jordan, just, just honestly just drinking it up. And we get back to the room and we're pretty smashed, right? But we have to put something out. So I, I just say, screw it. And I just put a camera on a tripod and the two of us drunk just talk. And whenever we needed to cut, I just did a jump cut, which felt terrible to me. I uploaded it. I just said to hell with it. Here it is, people. Sorry. <laughs> and I felt so bad because I wasn't being professional. I hadn't been following the 180 rule or all those traditional filmmaker rules that I had been taught. And sure enough, when I saw all the people at the press event in the morning, I I got my balls busted. They did. They were like, oh, nice jump cuts. Because honestly, there was a time when people looked down on simple jump cuts like what I'm doing here. Six hours later, when I checked how the video was doing, I had something like a quarter of a million views. And all the feedback from people was that they absolutely loved it. I still often shoot using traditional techniques and sometimes I shoot using more casual techniques, but I change my style depending on the format and the audience. So if a local brewery were to hire me and they're the type where they want you to know the name of every waiter and they want you to know the name of the person in the back, like making sure the temperature on the vats are correct. If, if they want that deep personal connection for social media, I would film it with jump cuts and I would film it casually. I would use professional skills to make it look like it was filmed casually. You're almost, it, it, it gets so meta because only your professional skills can make it look like it wasn't done professionally, if that makes sense. But if there were a major hotel chain and they hired me to come in and give a walkthrough for their hotel for promotion, I would not film that way. I would put stuff on a gimbal and I would follow the 180 rule. I'd give people teleprompters. I'd have two cameras going so I could cut around and um if they said it. Learn the traditional cinematic techniques, but also pay attention to how your friends talk on a FaceTime or on social media because that is what most people consider to be sincere and you should be able to replicate that. Let's talk about movement in a shot. With stills photography, something like landscape photography, you could just take a picture of a beautiful mountain and that can be so popular on your Instagram. But that is an incredibly boring video clip because video requires movement. A still photo does not work. And that was upsetting to me as a longtime landscape photographer. I started just switching over to video and publishing that. I was like, oh my God, this is incredibly boring. If you want a video of a mountain, you need to wait for some like a V of geese to fly through the sky. Or you can move the camera. Camera movement is a popular technique in filmmaking. 
for when the subject is still, but you need to make it a little bit more dynamic. So you could put your camera on a gimbal and kind of slide it forward past some reeds so that things are moving past. Or one of my favorite techniques is just to use a drone. So I could pan along the water and show the waves coming in with that same mountain coming in. No matter what, you need some kind of movement or in a shot or it's going to be incredibly boring. If you're doing a hybrid shoot for a restaurant, something I've done many times, you'll get some still shots of the food, but when you go to get video of the food, you need the chef like sprinkling some uh, Himalayan salt over it or, or chopping up some basil. As a photographer, we learned the reciprocal rule to cancel out camera shake. As a videographer, it's a little bit different. Like camera shake is generally intolerable, especially in anything kind of corporate, but camera shake can invade a casual attitude. So generally camera shake is a bad thing. You should use a tripod when you would be shooting stills handheld, but at the same time you can think about when it is appropriate to introduce a certain amount of camera shake, but I will say not usually. You should also be adding in a gimbal and a drone to a lot of your footage to allow you to capture those moving shots without introducing some kind of camera shake. Ever since I was a kid, I heard smile and say cheese, cheese, and they snap a picture. That doesn't work in video. That works with still photography because you're capturing something at 1 1 25th of a second. You need people to appear happy for the slightest amount of time to make it work, but that doesn't work on video. On video, if somebody's not an actor, if they're just a civilian, you actually have to get them in a good mood if you want them to appear happy on video because people aren't that good at faking it. We're gonna have this smile, like this forced smile that's all uh, nervous. People are gonna be nervous when you point a camera at them. So if you have a job where you need to film civilians, like the chef at the restaurant, like the CEO of the hotel that you're filming, you're probably gonna have to spend some time with them, getting them relaxed in front of you, getting them in front of the camera, and it goes beyond just smiling and saying, saying cheese or making a knock-knock joke to make a little kid smile, right? So I suggest setting the camera up as early as possible. And then you spend some time just fussing with the lights or waiting for the hair and makeup to come or whatever. But you get there a little early and you chat that person up. You make them comfortable and you get them to just talk about what they're going to be talking about. And you'll find that when they casually explain it to you, they'll talk like a human. And then as soon as you hit record, they'll be like, well, in 1927, this company was founded. And you're like, no, no, stop. We don't want you to be a newscaster. Drop the Midwestern accent. Be yourself. Talk to me like you were earlier. And if you talk to somebody casually and they do it right, you can say, remember what you just did. Like, Think about how you're talking, your intonation. That's natural. I want you to try to be natural on camera. Pretend the camera's not pointed at you. That's not gonna work for everybody, but it is a trick for kind of jump-starting a civilian who needs to be on camera. But if you do need to be on camera, that's, that's really hard. Like, I'm not great on camera, and I've been at this like 11 years. It's really hard to get comfortable and to just be yourself on camera. Also, you could get a bunch of takes. Get them to say the same thing 10 times. One of the reasons is they might screw up and say the wrong word in one of the takes, and you might miss it. So if you get 10 takes, you can either cut two takes together or go back and find the one where they didn't happen to screw it up. Now, storytelling is incredibly different between stills photography and videography. With stills photography, if you, let's say you want to convey that it is raining and this person in the red dress is in Paris. You have one frame to do all of that. So you, already, you have it pictured in your mind, right? The person is standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. That establishes that they're in Paris and you know, they're holding an umbrella because that's really the best way to convey that it's raining in a still photo. You can piece all that together with one still photo. With video, you don't have to cram the whole message into a single frame. You can do a close-up on the raindrops on the cobblestone streets. And then you could do a wide orbital shot from a drone of the Eiffel Tower. And then you cut to the person walking down the street. And our brain pieces these completely separate images together to create a single story. And that is one of the most exciting things about filmmaking is that extra flexibility you have for storytelling. So watch TV shows and movies and think about how they convey things differently than you would have to do in a single still photo. I can't teach all cinematic techniques here, but I will mention wide, medium, tight. <laughs> Anytime I'm filming something and the location matters, I get a wide shot, often with a drone, 
orbiting the entire town. And then I get a medium shot. It's of the building or the location that we're at, and then I go in tight. And if you get all three of those shots, it at least gives you the flexibility later to piece together a better story. It also requires a lot of planning to make sure that you get all the shots. And in Hollywood, they would typically use storyboards where they actually like draw out each individual scene so they know how to arrange the cameras. You probably don't have to storyboard stuff. I don't, but I do make pretty intricate outlines talking about each different location and what I need in that particular frame. And that way I know I get everything on location because you can't always go back and refilm something, right? And if you do, it's, it slows you down. It's all about workflow and efficiency. So having a good outline where you can get 100% of the shots you need makes things go much faster. One of the ways to make that easier is to shoot with multiple cameras. I'm shooting with just one camera now, but when Chelsea and I film our podcast, we use a three camera shoot. There's one wide two shot showing the both of us and then there's close ups of both me and Chelsea and that allows us to cut camera angles to make it a little bit more interesting but because we don't use jump cuts in the podcast it's a more traditional format. Whenever I need to cut around an um or an ah or a technical problem we just switch cameras and that allows things to keep moving. Using multiple cameras and multiple camera angles makes post-production much simpler, but it also makes it more visually interesting. So it's very traditional in an interview to have one wide shot and two close-up shots, B-roll, and then switch between them. You'll hear the terms A-roll and B-roll. A-roll is the main shot and B-roll is anything else really, something that you can cut to. When you are cutting between multiple cameras, it's very important that those cameras match. If one of the cameras has the exposure stop off, it's going to seem real weird when you switch. If the color on one is slightly different because one camera is a Sony, one is a Canon, that's going to seem a little weird. In fact, you could have two Canon cameras and have a Rokinon lens and a Canon lens and those lenses might allow different levels of different parts of the spectrum through leading for each to have slightly different color. When you do a multi-camera shoot, it makes everything flow easier if you have matching cameras and matching sets of lenses. And in fact, cinema lenses tend to be sold in matching sets to make switching cameras more seamless. Cinema lenses also tend to be labeled in T-stops, not F-stops, because T-stops actually measure the light coming out of the lens, even though they're very similar to F-stops. F-stops are measuring the ratio of the focal length to the size of the aperture, and all they really tell you is uh, the amount of depth of field, since different lenses could block different amounts of light as it travels through the lens itself might not have all that cinema gear and matching sets of lenses, that's okay. You can still use multiple cameras, but try to match the settings as close as possible and make up for the rest of it with proper grading. Real filmmakers end up doing that anyway, but it does make it easier when they're matched. Grading is post-processing, things like color, saturation, and exposure that can be done in post. Those tools are very different from the Lightroom that you're accustomed to, but I'm not gonna teach you all that now. Another tip is to make your outline, make your storyboard, but then rearrange it in a sequence that is more efficient for the production of it. In other words, you're filming things out of sequence. When Chelsea and I film one of our review videos, this will usually be out of sequence. Often we have two shots where it's the two of us and then Chelsea talks one shot sometimes and I talk one shot sometimes. What we'll usually do is we'll film all the two shots together. We'll film the introduction and the summary at the same time. And then we'll do all of Chelsea's one shots and then we'll do all of my one shots because it's easier to keep the same person on camera. And at the end of each sequence, we'll go back and get any close-ups or B-roll that we might need to make sure we can cut. When I'm completely done with everything, I'll put the drone in the air and I'll get some establishing shots of the area. I do the drone last, you know why? Because sometimes a civilian is freaked out by the drone. Like people are still get a little paranoid like the drone is spying on them even though I'm just trying to get a wide shot. And they, they can come up to you and harass you and at that point you're probably gonna wanna leave. If I do the drone shot last, well I already have all the footage and I can head out and it's not a problem. I am dynamic about that if I'm filming on location. Sometimes I'll show up to a park and somebody will just be mowing. In that case, I might get the establishing shots and the B-roll first and then wait for them to cut the mower before I actually record the things that need good sound. Let's talk about the term coverage. Coverage means having all the footage you need and extra. And I've kind of hinted at it, but I do want to say overshoot. Think about where you're going to cut and if something goes wrong, what you can possibly cut to. And that means 
often shooting multiple camera angles. If you only have a single camera, have the person deliver all their lines to the camera and then change the angle, zoom in and have them repeat it. That's a little more difficult to cut between. It could seem a little bit more unnatural, but it's still better than nothing. I mentioned earlier, I shoot 4K 60 to allow me to have coverage by cropping in for a different angle or slowing things down 50% to stretch things out. If you do shoot with two cameras, make sure that they each have some amount of sound so that you can sync them up in post. Syncing things by what they call scratch sound, the on-camera sound, is very, very useful. I will note, you can't usually do that with drones because drones don't typically record any sound at all because the props are so loud. Worst case, you could rely on stock footage. Like we use Storyblocks, who sponsored us way back when, but I still use them. If we have a shot that's midday and suddenly I need to talk about astrophotography, I need to have the sunset, I will just go grab a random clip of a sunset and drop it in there to help tell the story that time has passed. Stock footage is frequently used in like real productions and movies, so go for it. Use that to save your butt. Now let's talk about aspect ratio, which is the ratio of the width to the height. With still photography, we almost always hold the camera like this. Almost all cameras have a 3 by 2 aspect ratio because that is the natural aspect ratio of 35 millimeter film upon which everything is still based on. But the video that you're watching now is 16 by 9. Almost everything on YouTube is 16 by 9. Films are even wider than 16 by 9, and if you displayed them on 16 by 9, then things have to be letterboxed, right? But nowadays, an increasingly popular format is vertical. If you go on TikTok or Instagram, they like all vertical formats. And that can be really difficult because often you'll be asked to create a video for multiple different aspect ratios. Your client will want to have something in 16 by 9 on YouTube for their website, but then they want something for their TikTok or Insta, and it needs to be vertical. And not just is that footage vertical, but you have to leave a bunch of sort of negative space around the edges of the frame because if you ever go to TikTok, you have a bunch of like buttons and comments and text and stuff that's taking it up. And the composition is really difficult and it requires really rethinking a lot. I found when I started shooting in different aspect ratios after being a still photographer, it was really challenging because so much of the art of photography is in the composition. It's how you arrange things in your 3 by 2 horizontal frame. So you have to spend some time learning how to use the different aspect ratios and accommodating for that and give yourself that time. I will say when clients ask you to produce both widescreen and vertical formats, it is very tempting to shoot everything wide and crop it both ways. You can do that but I don't find that it works very well. When you letterbox widescreen to a vertical format like TikTok, there's a lot of black on the screen. It's not nearly as attention getting or immersive and more people are going to scroll past it than they would if you had shot it vertically. And if you shoot it wide enough that you could fill the frame by cropping both down, then it's kind of like you've sacrificed both compositions because they would both have to have massive amounts of negative space either at the top and bottom or on the sides and it's going to look a little weird. So I end up just kind of shooting everything twice, which I actually think is okay because generally the tone, the culture of YouTube and TikTok is different enough that I would want to present things differently anyway. Let's talk about audio, which is extremely important, incredibly vital. Bad sound ruins the entire clip. If you can't get good sound, you have to throw it out. But unfortunately, auto is extremely hard and as photographers, we have no experience doing audio. To make that even more complex, audio is like the most important thing, but here in 2023, there's no guarantee that somebody consuming your clip is going to hear the audio. So you have to kind of have audio for those who use it, but not rely on it to tell your story because so many people are on TikTok or YouTube and they might be reading the closed captions or they might just be watching the video visually. The best content is going to allow the audio to be optional. I'll talk about the mics that you should use in a little bit, but I do want to give some hints. Final Cut has great voice isolation tool. It's just a checkbox and it solves so many problems with background noise. However, it will also strip out all the ambient sounds. Often, like I'm in a beautiful park and all you can see in the shot is a beautiful, peaceful park. And I want to convey that with audio, but there happens to be a highway or a train going on behind me and the audio conveys something very different from the visuals. What I can do is click that voice isolation, cut all the ambient so all you hear is my voice and then I go to Storyblocks and I download uh, ambient forest sounds and I drop that in as a replacement for the missing ambient sound. Voila! You have pieced together a story that is not 
entirely nonfiction, but feels much more natural to somebody. I also heavily rely on audio plugins from a company called Crumple Pop to remove annoying sounds, to remove wind that might hit the mic, or to reduce the amount of echo that you hear. When you bring up sound, people always ask me, what mic should I get? And if you have bad sound in your video, people will tell you, you need to get a new mic. Everybody's first inclination is to blame the gear, but it's almost never the gear. There's so many things besides the mic that you should think about. Like the most important factor is simply proximity. And over the years, we've tried different combinations of shotgun mics mounted to the cameras or shotgun mics mounted to the boom. What we find works best for us are simply lav mics, just visible lav mics. You can get them that tape onto your skin or whatever, but I just stick it to my shirt. And if I go outside, I stick it in a furry, what they call a dead cat to reduce the amount of wind noise. And that has worked for us, but feel free to experiment and do different things. The single most important factor in the audio quality that you get is not the brand of the mic, but it is the proximity to the sound that you want to record. And that means getting the mic really close and keeping it at a constant distance. You know, I can move around and uh, emote and the microphone stays basically the same relative distance to my face. But if I had a microphone fixed on the camera and I leaned back, the audio levels would suddenly go down and then the ambient noise in relation to the audio levels would come way up and that makes everything much harder. And as a result, we simply rely on laughs. Music can ruin a clip or completely save your butt. I, I don't know how many times I've been out in public filming stuff and somebody is just playing top 10 in the background and it picks up the sound. Sometimes I don't even notice it because I'm so tuned into what I'm filming. Then you edit the video, you publish it to YouTube and YouTube's like, copyright strike, we're giving all your money to Rihanna because her song was playing in the background. So what you want to do is make sure you don't have any copyrighted sounds playing in the background, but you do want to add music in. Adding in some background music, that is a skill in and of itself, but it can make a huge difference. It can make or break a video. For that, we use Epidemic Sound, just a recommendation. Storage is incredibly important for photographers. We take a lot of pictures, but video will require about 10 times more storage. And that also means like more time to transfer the things, more expense in storing the storage. So of course you need bigger memory cards. You might also need faster memory cards, particularly for your resolution and frame rate. You'll just have to look at your preferred formats and make sure that the card supports that. It might not be the number of megabytes per second that's written on the card because that's often overstated. That's often the read speed. That's often the momentary read speed. You need sustained write speed. I've been bitten by this a few times, like my Nikon Z9, I was trying to film AK60 footage and it kept cutting off after like 20 seconds because I had a card that claimed to be fast enough, but it could not handle the sustained write speed. So I had to go and buy a card that was way overpowered in order to successfully record that particular format. Memory cards fail. Their failure rate is directly proportional to the amount of data that you write to that card. If you've just taken a bunch of JPEGs, chances are you might never see a memory card failure. But if you're shooting 4K60 all the time and you're just filling up terabytes and terabytes, I have over 100 terabytes of storage, you're going to have failures. And the rate at which Chelsea and I generate data and write it to memory cards, we get about one to two memory card failures a year. And if we're writing to one card, that means we have to completely redo that entire shoot or try to find coverage for the clip that is corrupted. You don't want that to happen. And for that reason, just for the sake of my workflow, I insist all of our video cameras write to two cards because I don't want to be reshooting things. In a studio, we used fixed cameras going through HDMI out into a computer so that we don't have to do that. That saves me having to remove the memory cards and load them up. It speeds up our workflow. But even in those situations, I have the HDMI out going into a field recorder that I start separately, and then the HDMI out goes to the computer. So even there, I have redundancy in the form of the field recorder. Redundancy is critical to your workflow. You cannot shoot somebody's wedding and then Tell them that, oh, I didn't get the video clip of you walking up the aisle because the memory card failed and I only had one card slot. You also need redundancy throughout the post-production process. I had a video editor who just had their hard drive fail and my footage was okay, but he had several other clients where he had to go back and reshoot and that is bad for his business and it was heartbreaking for him and it meant that he was doing a bunch of extra work without being paid for it. You need redundancy, not just when you're capturing, but when you're working on and storing the footage for as long as the storage might possibly be useful. Your MacBook 
has a single hard drive. It does not have redundancy in it, but it does have the capability to back things up and back things up in real time. You need real-time continuous backups unless you want to redo all of your work, right? When you copy the files from your camera to your computer, leave them on the SD card for a while. I get oversized SD cards so I don't have to erase them. That way, if my computer immediately fails, I can go back and pull it back from the card and redo any work that I've done. But I also have a continuous backup from my computer to a Synology NAS system. And that way, as soon as I copy it over, within a couple of minutes, it's backed up to the NAS. And if my computer completely fails, I can go grab another MacBook from Best Buy and copy my files back over and continue working. That also keeps all of the edits that I make in Final Cut continuously updating. That NAS, of course, it uses a RAID, what they call redundant array of inexpensive disks, which allows for one drive to fail. I have 100 terabytes of data, so that means I have something like 16 drives, 12 drives. That means my odds of having a single drive fail are increasingly higher and higher because there are so many drives. In the six years that I've had this Synology NAS, I've probably had to replace eight or nine drives. Like It just happens on a regular basis because statistically that is going to happen. Have a backup, have redundancy in that backup, and then finally have an off-site backup for your backup because flooding, fire, theft. Even if you have RAID, somebody breaks in your house and steals your whole NAS, do you want to have to go back to the client? I don't. So I have another NAS located at somebody else's house and they have good bandwidth and it just syncs across the internet to them. And that is my worst case scenario. I've never had to use the offsite backup, but if my NAS with all of its RAID does fail or I get robbed or there's a fire, I know at least my data is safe. Let's talk about post-processing, which is completely different for stills photographers and videographers. No video editing tool looks anything like Lightroom. I really thought editing color and exposure and contrast would just be the same sliders, but there are analogs for everything, and I'm not gonna teach them to you, but I just wanted to warn you about that. You need a higher performance computer in order to edit video than you do stills, obviously, because you're shooting 30 or 60 frames every second. There's just more work to be done. But you can shoot in 8K and edit it on your old crappy computer if you want to by generating proxies of all of the footage. Apps like Final Cut will do that for you pretty automatically. You just have to select a checkbox and then let it render for a little while. If your computer is not up for the task of real-time editing, look up how to make proxies within your video editor and use that feature, but add some additional time into your workflow because you'll have to import the footage and then wait for your app to process it. As a stills photographer, I don't know how many times I've said, I'll just fix it in post. Sometimes I'm to porch shoot, client has a big old wrinkle on their shirt and I'm like, oh, I gotta get the client to take their shirt off. I gotta go back and iron it to fix it. Or you know what? I could just clone that out in Photoshop. Sometimes it is genuinely easier to fix it in post. That line is gonna shift when you're shooting video. Fixing things in post is significantly harder in video. Removing a pimple from somebody's face, do it with makeup, easier than doing it in post-processing because you know what? You're not Pixar. You don't have a whole team of people doing special effects and stuff. As much as possible, get it right in camera and still plan to spend some time grading. Now let's talk about the gear that you might need for video. First up, which camera should you use? Well, that's a hard question. Honestly, so many people come to me and said, I want to get into video. I have a budget of $300. What camera should I buy? And I tell them, you got a phone, right? You're going to use your phone you only got 300 bucks. You're going to put that 300 bucks towards a good microphone and some good lights. If you have a few extra bucks, you'd put it towards a gimbal. If you told me you had a thousand bucks and you wanted to do a whole video operating rig, I'd say you're shooting with your phone, you're getting a gimbal for your phone, you're getting a mic, you're getting some lights, and then you're also getting a drone. The camera, not the first thing you should buy because phone footage is often acceptable, especially if everything around it is professional if you have smooth footage and nice lights. But at some point you should pick up a real camera. People screw this up too. They say, oh, which 4K 60 camera should I get? No, you're starting in the wrong place. Start by thinking about the shots that you want to get and then identifying the lenses that can produce that. I'm shooting with shallow depth of field now. That's important to me. So that means I'm limited to systems that support a 50 millimeter f1.2 lens and that's in full frame terms. So I have to factor in the crop factor. That means I cannot do it with a Fuji camera. I cannot get this effect. I cannot get it with micro four thirds. I'm really limited to Sony or Canon. I also know that I need good video autofocus. And again, in my testing, that means you're limited to Sony or Canon. Identify 
your lenses first and then find the camera that supports the lenses you want to use. You will also find a lot of dedicated cinema cameras. Canon, Sony, Panasonic, they all make both hybrid stills video cameras and dedicated cinema cameras. The biggest difference isn't the footage. Your footage is gonna look exactly the same. The biggest differences tend to be in workflow. The ZV line of cameras from Sony are video centric and they're usually based on one of their hybrid cameras, but then they put like a built-in cage in. They put some extra tripod mounts in there that will allow you to mount an extra microphone or a light to it, or maybe they allow you to mount it on a tripod sideways, something you might want to do for your TikTok or vertical videos. Panasonic cinema cameras will have like big XLRs in them, so you can hook up big traditional analog mics and they feed out phantom power. That's the kind of thing you're going to get with a cinema camera. Your footage is going to look exactly the same. I don't need all those cinema features, which is why I'm filming this on a Canon R6, which is a Still's first hybrid camera, but it's been just fine. Just some factors to consider when you are choosing your camera. If you are currently shooting with a DSLR, Nikon D850, Canon 5D Mark IV or something, you can definitely shoot video with those things, but there are big advantages to going mirrorless. First, mirrorless cameras have an electronic viewfinder. So this, what you get on the back screens is exactly the same here. That electronic viewfinder is really useful for cinematographers. Now, you're probably not going to be filming everything with your eye like this because often your shot's gonna be low, tilting, or flip screen are incredibly important for that. But when you go to review your footage, you wanna make sure everything's in focus. It might be in full sun. You might not be able to see that rear screen at all. The electronic viewfinder is incredibly useful for that or for just changing your settings. DSLRs don't have that capability with the viewfinder and just blocking out the light, I think is the most useful thing about having an electronic viewfinder. As you're selecting a camera, I wanna warn you, Many of them will say advertise 4K or 4K 60, some frame rate or resolution that you think you need, but they don't actually deliver in the way that you think you might. Like this Canon R100 here actually supports 4K footage and Canon advertises it. But if you shoot 4K, first it only does 24 frames a second and you're probably not filming Netflix with this, right? So you'd probably want at least 30 frames per second, but it does also does it with an incredibly heavy crop. So you would not be able to shoot any sort of wide angle footage because no super, super wide angle lenses would exist for it. And that's kind of a deal breaker. And I would hate for somebody to buy this as a 4K camera and then realize it wasn't going to fulfill their needs. Also, some cameras support a particular resolution, but they achieve that resolution through a process called pixel binning, where they're dropping many of the lines and be half the lines of the footage. What happens is the resulting footage is lower quality. It is noisier and less sharp because the camera is not using all of the available light. It's like you're using a full frame sized sensor, but with the quality of micro four thirds. Check the reviews on our channel because we will call those types of things out. Tripods are different between stills photographers and videographers. As a stills photographer, you usually use a ball head tripod that can easily rotate to vertical whenever you want. It allows totally free movement. As a videographer, you typically use a pan tilt head with a leveling head. What that means is you can put your camera on the tripod, loosen up the center column, make it completely level. Now you can use a handle to pan left or right or move up and down. Often they will have fluid movement. So those tilts and pans are completely smooth. What they don't generally allow you to do is go to vertical. Now, of course, we are living in the era of vertical video, which means you might again go back to using a ball head just to make that easier or you get some kind of cage that you put on your camera that would allow it to rotate to vertical while still using your same pan tilt tripod. The gimbal I find to be extremely important. We frequently use a handheld gimbal to introduce camera movement, make shots a little bit more interesting so it's not super boring like this talking head style video. When you're selecting a gimbal, lighter is always better. You are holding the, the gimbal, which is the weight of the gimbal plus the weight of the camera and lens and any microphone that you might have attached and some shots can go on long. And the last thing you need is the videographer to have to take a break because they can't support it anymore. Now, of course, this depends on you and your own personal size. I can run a gimbal for much longer than Chelsea can, and gimbals come with a weight rating. That is the maximum amount of weight that you can fly on that gimbal, the camera and lens and microphone attached. Do not come anywhere near that weight rating. Find the gimbal that meets your weight requirements for your camera and lens and then go up an entire level. Because if you come near that weight rating, you will find it is difficult to get the 
gimbal balance. You will find that if you zoom or change something slightly, it will fall out of balance. You will spend more and more time stopping and rebalancing the gimbal. So while it might technically work, in practice it will be more difficult. Basically, lower power gimbals increase your workflow and production time and they require more retakes because you're fussing with the gimbal. As a result, we use the DJI RS3. We typically are shooting a Sony a7S III with like a 24 or 35 f1.4 prime lens and it is way overpowered for that. But it means that if something is a little bit off on the balance, it's still going to work and I'm not going to have to interrupt the shoot and rebalance everything. Finally, working a gimbal is an entire career in and of itself. Like in Hollywood, there are steady cam operators whose job it is to do that and that's all they do. So you can't just pick up a gimbal and think you're going to make great looking footage day one. You need to practice getting those smooth movements, those smooth transitions and figuring out all the different modes of the gimbal. A lot of people feel like they need a field recorder, largely because companies like Ronin market their ninja field recorders very successfully and you feel like real cinematographers always have one of these things. We tried these things. We own them, but we don't typically use them out in the field. Now the field recorder will give you a bigger screen. The field recorder might also record higher quality footage from your cameras. Some cameras will record raw footage out to a field recorder when they wouldn't do it internally and theoretically you're getting better quality footage, but field recorders come with a bunch of downsides. First, you're making your whole rig much bigger and more complex. It's a wired connection, typically HDMI out, and that means those wires can come loose and screw everything up. The field recorder requires a separate battery and that battery can run out. That's an extra battery that you have to charge and bring. All that extra complexity is the enemy of an efficient workflow because when you introduce more things, you introduce more things that can go wrong. So for me, through lots of trial and error, I have finally just decided to use the crappy flip screen on the back of the camera and record internally, even though that might be making some sacrifices to the viewing experience and the footage being produced, I find that's what helps me produce things and nobody complains, it's just fine. You're also going to need additional batteries. Shooting video requires far more power than shooting individual stills, so get extra batteries. Do not rely on old batteries which run out of power faster. Also, I don't trust third-party batteries because I've had bad experiences with just about all the major third-party battery manufacturers where a six-month-old battery will just cut out in the middle of a shoot. It'll go from two bars to completely dead. And I don't know why they all seem to do that, but the name brand batteries never seem to do that. And as a result, I just use name brand batteries. Echoing is bad. If you have a dedicated space like a filming studio like we do here, use acoustic panels to reduce the amount of echoing. We have acoustic panels everywhere. And without it, everything's very echoey. If you do have echo, Crumble Pop Echo Remover AI does a lot, but it's always better to catch everything clean in camera. If you are filming somebody, you might want to monitor the sound with headphones. I mean, you, absolutely, you should monitor the sound with headphones. That way you can tell if the person's mic cuts off without having to look at the levels. You, if wind catches it and you're getting a rustling in there, you know you might want to go put on a dead cat. Next up is lights. As a photographer, you're probably accustomed to using strobes, just flashes that give off just a small amount of light momentarily. Obviously, that won't work with video. You need continuous lights. Continuous lights, however, don't work well with stills, and I have yet in lots of testing to find continuous lights that work well for stills, even though some of them offer that benefit. I don't like it. So we have two sets of lights right now, but we do use a single set of light modifiers. So we use Bowen's mount for our light modifiers, our soft boxes and stuff. We use Flashpoint strobes. For continuous lights, we currently use the Aperture 300D Mark two and I use the same light modifiers. A lot of people when they get into video, I don't know why, when they're shooting stills they have like an eight foot octobox and then they shoot video and they're like, oh I got this uh, a four by five LED light and they put it on top of the camera. Like the same rules of light apply. Having big soft light sources is generally way more flattering and so when we're out and about I will just use my continuous light with my soft box but continuous light requires way more power than a strobe. So if you want to be shooting at ISO 100, you really do need a big and powerful light to fill up a softbox. All that power also means you're usually going to prefer plugging it in, though we do have batteries. The batteries will burn pretty fast, so I usually use AC power whenever I can. You're going to need some device to actually edit the video, and a lot of people start out editing video on your smartphone, and that can be okay. But your workflow 
will benefit if you go to a traditional computer with a bigger screen or preferably multiple monitors. Multiple monitors allow you to use one that's dedicated as the AV out. I have a 4K monitor, 30 inch, and I put up my footage full screen that way. If something's out of focus or the color's off, I can just see it that much more easily than if it's in like a little window. So definitely get multiple big monitors, hopefully with a native resolution, similar to that of what you're publishing in. A lot of people in the video world use Macs. I worked for Microsoft. I was a PC guy for most of my life and I switched to Macs and I'm happy that I did it. The whole ecosystem is, is really built around creators like us. The new Macs with the M1, M2, or soon to come M3 chips really do outperform similar PCs. The Macs can run DaVinci, they can run Premiere, but you also get the option of choosing Final Cut or a few different Apple specific products. So basically having a Mac means that you have more options available to you. Whatever computer you get, you want at least 32 gigs of RAM, if not more. More is always better. And for storage, you want the biggest drive you can. You can cheap out and get a smaller hard drive, but at some point you're going to fill it up and you're going to be mad at yourself. And if you're always plugging in a USB-C drive, well, you're going to hate that at some point too. I want to briefly talk about the business of videography compared to the business of photography. Much of it is the same. You're making contacts in the same way. You're negotiating contracts in the same way. Most of the process of figuring out the deliverables and revisions is going to be very similar, but it's all amped up with videography. Your prep time is much more for video than it is for stills. Your production time is more. Your equipment is more and it's more expensive. Your post-production time exponentially more than it is for stills photography. And as a result, all of your costs are going to go up and that means your prices need to go up too. But that also means that your profits can go up. That's it. I would like to hear your experience now in the comments down below. If you are a photographer who went into the world of video what did you learn? What tips do you want to share with other people? What did I get wrong? I'm not going to be offended. I just want people to learn. And of course, please subscribe to my channel. That's what makes totally free unsponsored videos like this possible. I just want to teach people. If you like this video, if you subscribe and you comment, that tells the YouTube algorithm that it should feed to other people. So if you think this has been helpful, then please help bring it to other people by sharing it. Bye.